My name is Eric van Dedeken. I am the author of Chariots of the Cards and quite some other title. But today I have the pleasure to talk with Paul Stonehill. Paul is a former Soviet Union refugee who has become a US citizen. Therefore, it is clear that Paul Stonehill speaks fluent Russian and also Ukrainian. And he had access to Russian information about UFOs and other mysteries which were not known in the Western world. Paul helped building bridges between the Soviet and the American UFO researchers. In October 1939, the worldwide known Omni magazine published a story about Paul Stonehill's work. Of course, Paul has appeared in different TV shows and series, including the Discovery Channel, the History Channel, TNT, etc., and some numerous radio shows worldwide. And of course, again, Paul Stonehill is the author of several books about the Soviet UFO files or the Russian Roswell incident. I am happy to finally have this brilliant explorer as an interview partner. And here I start with my first question to Paul. Paul, just let us know how did you start your interest in mysteries and in UFOs? I started uh, back as a teenager in the Soviet Union and you were a part of it as well because your books and the movie that was aired in the Soviet Union made a great impact on many people in the Soviet Union, young and old, because you talked about subjects that very few in the Soviet Union did. There were people like Garbovsky, like Zaitsev and so forth, but you made it a mass phenomenon in a country that was not really accustomed to such information. Plus some other meetings I had in the Soviet Union in my youth with people who observed UFOs in the Arctic and so forth. And so it began. But how old were you when it began, your interest in UFO? How old were you? I was, I would say I was about 11 or 12 when I began interest in UFOs and paranormal phenomena. Okay, now, most of us in the Western world, we know about the Roswell incident in the United States. But we were never informed about the similar incident in Russia. Please let us know what you know about this Russian Roswell incident. Well, in 1986, uh, there was a crash of an object in the city of Dalnigorsk in the Far East uh, on the border with China. Very unusual incident when an object crashed and tried to uh, come back up and crashed again. And the material that was left behind was very controversial. But, uh, metals that we allegedly could not produce without our modern technology. What's interesting is that about a year later, a whole school of UFOs, a whole fleet of UFOs came to that area in the Far East and witnessed by many credible witnesses. And um, what's interesting also is that the Soviet government did not talk too much about it. It was like, okay, it never happened. But we knew that something took place and we still don't know exactly what happened. So you think the Soviet Union, I mean, today the Russians, they still have some debris, rest of this UFO, of this technology. Yes, actually the debris, the metal balls and nets, uh, so a description of the objects that was recovered is in the institutes of the Russian Federation. But that's not the only thing that they have. However, this one we studied in great detail. Unfortunately, people who have done actual research on site are, have passed on, uh, Dvuzilny and others. But still, this case is not closed. OK, the case is not closed. Now, you have intensively researched about the Yakut people. Who are these people? I never hear about them. What is their mythology? Well, yeah, the Yakut people are people, uh, indigenous people of the Russian North. 
in the Arctic Circle, parts of Siberia, they have a great mythology, Apos. And in it, I was curious to find out that they talk about iron fish that lives at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, using our modern language, we're speaking about submarines. Um, but besides that, Mr. Danikan, in Yakutia, there are so-called cauldrons, objects that are embedded in permafrost, huh? objects that emitted radiation. And we know where those objects are buried, sometimes almost to the, you know, 10 kilometers away and so forth. Unfortunately, they have been flooded. The area has been flooded with water uh, because of these state projects. What's interesting is that the beliefs of the uh, Yakut people uh, talk about great underground abysses, like voids where the laughing uh, entities live. And they speak about uh, great heroes of the past that came from the space, from outer space and landed on this planet. And with time, whatever was left behind, metal objects sunk into the permafrost, went down. But once in a while, the aperture opens up and an object flies out like a missile. And what's interesting is this is what is attributed to the 1908 uh, Tunguska event that an object was actually fired from Tonga, from, from, sorry, from Yakutia to shoot down this invader that could have caused great harm to our planet had it not been eliminated. Oh, now you just mentioned twice Yakutia. Excuse me, I'm just a Swiss born living citizen. I never heard about Yakutia. Where is Yakutia? It's in the north of Russia, in, in, in the Arctic Circle, also parts of uh, Siberia. It's a great land. It's much bigger than France, for example, in size. Yeah, there are many uh, natural resources and things like diamonds that are there and more. Now, next to Yakutia, you should know that too, is the Taimur, Taimur Peninsula, which was a closed off area, military area uh, in the Soviet Union. And that's where UFOs are flying quite a lot. And I, know, I mentioned it in my books with dates and details because Soviet military personnel, KGB scientists have seen and reported UFOs in the area of Sea of Laptev and all, all there, including such people like Vladimir Lukin, who was the head of the Russian Antarctic and Arctic expeditions. He personally observed UFOs in 1984 on a, a scientific expedition. We had a wave of UFOs in 1979 in that area, and it was in incredible, cited by military, by meteorologists, others. Very interesting land. Tell me, Paul, have you personally ever seen a UFO? Yes, but not in, of course, not in the Soviet Union, in the United States, in Southern California, back in 1990, we saw a fiery sphere chasing across the sky. A very unusual sight. Okay. Now, I also read that you know something concerning ancient maps of Mars in Armenia. I never heard of this. Please inform us. That's very interesting. A lot of things are not heard in the West because, you know, the Soviet Union ceased to exist mm. only, what, 30 years ago? and all the pent up information started coming out. And of course, we were very glad. And Russian researchers, I've been in touch with them, starting find, started finding out information. Well, this case was very interesting. Apparently, from the ancient library of Alexandria, some of the books were not destroyed millennia ago. They were saved. And one, some of the materials made uh, their ways around the world. One came to Armenia, who knows how? And this was a map, ancient map of Mars that only shows Deimos. It doesn't show Phobos, okay. what I recall. And this map uh, was stolen and then returned back to the library. And it's in the archives of Armenia. I hope one day we can get it. Uh, it was also, what's interesting is one of the uh, 
old time Georgian poets from the middle ages also mentioned this map. So people had seen it and the KGB had it in their hands and uh, one of them stole the map, but then it was returned back uh, to the archives. Okay, you know, as I know, most of the newspapers in our Western world do not inform the public about UFOs. Also, many astronomers deny the existence of, of UFOs. What, in your opinion, is the reason for that? Why do they deny it? Why do they don't want to, want to know something about UFOs? Well, in the Western world, uh, of course, apathy and fear to lose a job, uh, sticking to the established policies, it's uh, easier not to rock the boat and get your salary and move on. But there were a number of scientists in the Soviet Union who were not afraid. Professor Burdakov, uh, who was very much involved in the Soviet space program and was Karalev's, one of the people who worked with Sergei Karalev, father of Soviet space science. Uh, astronomers in my books with Philip Mantel, I mentioned a number of astronomers who came out and spoke about it. There were people who were not afraid to write to uh, President Kasigin, of course, to Brezhnev, uh, General Secretary Brezhnev, and other scientists who said, we need to continue UFO research. You could not clamp down, they used other words, but you, know, you should let us continue this research because we had a very active research in the Soviet Union that involved scientists and UFOs, unofficial research. And then the Soviets pursued also secret research of UFOs for the military and industrial needs. It was a program called Setka Net in Russian, and it was a comprehensive program where every member of the armed forces had to study UFOs. So the scientists were involved. Some did not want to do it, but they had to. Most were very much interested. In the West, maybe it's because people are afraid uh, to stir religious beliefs of some other people. Maybe it's just because of apathy. Apathy. I understand. You know, I am personally very, very familiar with the old writings. I know Herodotus' books. I know P Plato, of course. I know Strabo, Plutarch, and all these things. <clears throat> and I remember Herodot, roughly uh, 450 BC, he was in Egypt. And the, 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 the Egyptians showed Herodotus a, a kind of street or avenida with 341 statues. And the, the Egypt, Egyptian guide told to every statue a short story. This is the name he was living from them is then and so on. And at the end, the Egyptian guy told Herodotus, these 341 statues represent 11,340 years. And at that time, the gods from the firmament were among the humans. Since that time, the gods have not returned. Now Herodotus made this statement roughly two and a half thousand years from now on. So to the 11,340 years, we have to add 2,400 uh, 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 years from now to Herodotus. Roughly 14,000 years extraterrestrials should be here. Do you think that Stone Age people were influenced by extraterrestrials? <laughs> I believe that our planet had been visited on a number of times, and we have very interesting uh, confirmations. Um, if we look at ancient Chinese uh, writings, at Central Asian discoveries, um, and um, of course, the, uh, you mentioned Herodotus and others. Well, ancient Greeks knew so much in the Orphic studies and others I learned that was not revealed uh, to, to everybody else. They kept, kept secret knowledge, but somehow, somewhere this knowledge came, they knew, and not only them, even before them, they knew that the, our planet is a sphere, one of many, and there is the sun. They knew much more. Look at Shumer and uh, discovers of ancient India. This incredible knowledge that they had accumulated I'm not talk only talking about the manas and the unusual weapons and everything else. I believe, and I, I, I've read your books too, um, I believe that yes, we have been influenced by those who came to our planet. And what's more interesting, 
we are in their image. That means that the humanoids, it's the ultimate form of intelligence in the universe. And we have been visited by such humanoids from the past. <clears throat> Listen, I, I uh, was also reading uh, books of Ivan Yefremov. He was a great Soviet scientist, paleontologist who lived at the same time as the person you saw in Moscow, Kazantsev. Yes. I wish you, you met Efremov too, but not everything is possible. He influenced many people like me and cosmonauts and others in the Soviet Union with his books. Well, in his books, he talks about ancient knowledge, about Chinese um, uh, devices to, sow di- to see disease inside people, about ancient telescopes of Mesopotamia, of the great knowledge of India. He had to get that information somewhere. He was a very curious uh, scientist. And among the, uh, the people like you, who brought forth this knowledge. You know, when I was at the Soviet Union a long time ago, last time in Moscow, I also met Professor Dr. Shlovsky at that time in, 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 in Moscow. And he told me that the two Mars moons, Phobos and Deimos, must be artificial. Absolutely. What's interesting is I believe somebody scared Dr. Shklovsky later because he recanted. But we knew that what he said was so. What's interesting is that later Professor Burdakov and Marina Popovich and others were making a lot of noise when the Soviet Union sent the uh, space, space probes to Mars, to Phobos, and they perished. And one of them was destroyed in the um, orbit of Mars just before they had to do experiments on Phobos. Somebody doesn't want us to do experiments in that area. And this was a great expedition because it was not only Russian, it was for the most part West European and American and Russian participation, but they had to get to Phobos. Just like in 2011, Chinese and the Russians tried and they failed. They failed in, in, in our orbit. But soon, and you will see, soon there will be Chinese and American probes and Japanese to that plant. They know something is on Phobos. So you're right. Of course. And I, I remember the American astronaut Ed Mitchell, I knew him personally, said on Phobos, there is a monolight, something artificial. So I hope we will find this sooner or later. Now, for myself, I'm absolutely sure we were visited by beings from outer space. As you mentioned before, we have too many literary references in the old books of mankind. So this we clearly can prove. In the meantime, I have, I have published 44 books to the subject and there is no doubt we were visited by beings from outer space. And before these visitors left, they promised to some of our youngsters at that time, they will return in a far future. And I think they have returned. UFOs are the gods returned. And as you just mentioned before, according to many old writings, by the way, including the Bible, they say that the gods created humans according their image, which means we are similar than they and not the other way around. By coincidence, they are similar than we No, We are similar than they because we are their offsprings. So often I read by astronomers that I hear in astronomic book, if extraterrestrials do exist, they would look completely different to us. And it would not be possible to talk or to make communication with them. I think this is all rubbish. Of course, it might be that many forms of extraterrestrial life exist, forms which we cannot even imagine. But there are also forms like we, because we are the offsprings of them. Now, listen, as you know, Of course, you and I and all the authors in this uh, field, we are criticized. Many astronomers and so-called skeptics, they think uh, we are fools and we are telling wrong stories. How do you react? What do you say to the critics? critics. Well, because of my background uh, in the Soviet Union, I I lived in tough neighborhoods. And uh, sometimes the critics who attacked you did it physically. So you had to learn how to fight back. I think our 
you know, lifetimes are limited. So I don't want to waste too much time to speak to uh, talking heads who have their own agenda. There is so much to discover and do. And they knew it. I was attacked by, uh, I don't want to get into details, but also debunkers who seem to think they know about Russia and so forth. They were scared when the article about my work came out in Omni magazine because they don't want information to come out from the Soviet Union because they knew how much was accumulated. But I got to tell you something. For example, you take NASA. NASA published a monograph by a Soviet scientist who explored Mars and created vehicles to go to Mars. They published without comments. He talked about the ancient cities of Mars buried under the sands. They didn't say anything. There are other scientists who talk openly about this. Cosmonauts, Soviet and Russian cosmonauts who came out and they talked and they shared knowledge like Pavel Popovich, who is also from Ukraine, the first detachment of cosmonauts, brave, educated people who are flying out in space. He talked about underwater bases of aliens on this planet. They know they have the access to information we can't even dream about no. at the top levels of the government and people like scientists and cosmonauts. So I say, you know, go far away from us. We don't have time to waste on the bunkers. We have to move forward. Okay, that's a, a very good position. Yes, just go our way and don't lose too much time with them. Do you think, Paul, that the Darwinian theory of evolution is absolutely correct or is it maybe partly wrong? I think that it may be partly wrong. I think that the basic uh, form of the future human humanoids existed, but it was, there must have been additions to it, experiments, very interesting experiments that help create humans in the shape we are today and with the brain we have today. Okay. You see, we are criticized, authors like you and I, etc. And there is a certain spirit of time. In Germany, we have a wonderful word called der Zeitgeist, the spirit of time. And I know in the past uh, 10, 15 years, the Zeitgeist, the spirit of time has changed because of authors like you and many others. We have influenced the world. We have influenced scientists. And I'm very happy simply to know the spirit of time changes in our favor. We are sitting on the right horse and our critics slowly, slowly uh, will we, we lose their position. We were visited by beings from outer space yes. and they are back. Uh, let's see the UFOs, etc. Now, one question I ask to all of my interviewers. What do you think, Paul, is the purpose of our life? Why are we on this planet? We are on this planet to break out from planet and go on, become galactic um, mankind or humanity. And this, by, by using these ideas, this is what Tselkovsky was thinking, Ivan Yefremov. I come from that school of the Russian uh, thinking about the universe. I don't think we're on this planet uh, to think about our sins or, uh, you know, what, uh, how to... Uh, waste our lives. To me, the more knowledge, we need to, to study science, but real science, not science that would change on you and doesn't want you to look up, or to explore, to find out a way to travel, interstellar travel, and it will come to that. And with all the protections that we need from radiation and outer space, I believe in our science. I am more optimistic than people who cry on TV every day, because you need to know at the great strides we're making. And it's not only us, it's China, it's Russia, it's West, it's India. All working together, we can achieve a lot and we will. This is really fascinating because not only you and me, many of us have exactly the same feeling. What is the purpose of our life? We have to develop technologies. We have to to construct sooner or later spaceships. We have to go out in the universe. We have to multiply 
to multiply the knowledge in, into the universe and the spirit of time will change in the whole universe. I think it is a great way of thinking. In many parts, our way of thinking has something to do with today's politics. You know, since we humans, since we humans exist, the humans always make war. They make war for, for religions. They fight against each other because of their fronts, etc. Soon as we learn to understand that we are part of a cosmic family, then it doesn't matter anymore. Nobody will care if somebody is black or white or yellow yes. or red. We will realize we all are the human race, the intelligent on this planet, and we all represent this planet of Earth. So we have really, in all this sense, the same feeling and the same meeting.